known to uh, many of you, uh, I'm sure. Uh, first of all, he is a gaucho, uh, got his uh, undergraduate degree here. And uh, the thing I like about what Brent does is that he takes uh, a problem and turns it into uh, an opportunity <laughs> in, a, in a big way, um, especially with regard to his work on uh, carbon dioxide, which uh, many people are struggling to not only patrol, but to find something <coughs> to do with, put it under the ground. But Brent comes up with uh, just a fabulous uh, approach to uh, which he's going to tell us about today, to do something useful with it. Uh, but some of you may not also know that he is a very inventive person and has uh, had two or three companies also uh, developing cement. In fact, if you break your leg and end up needing as I did about 30 years ago, um, somebody to stick it back together, the chances are they'll be using a glue that Brent developed. Uh, that's uh, uh, something that uh, he is uh, well known for, in fact. Uh, he's currently a consulting professor at Stanford University and uh, been on the advisory board of the Stanford Environmental Molecular Science Institute. And uh, he's also currently affiliated with the Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford. And uh, he's uh, been honored by many, but one in particular that uh, I think he's quite proud of because it relates to some of the current work he's doing today is that marine science community in the Monterey Bay region awarded him the, I love this, the Global Ocean Hero Award uh, in 1999. That's a, that's a terrific award. Um, he's uh, most recently, uh, most of you know, been the um, CEO of Polara company that sequesters carbon dioxide from power plant emissions and turns it into uh, cement and related products. Um, and currently, he's managing partner and CEO of Deepwater Desals, company building a desalination plant on uh, Monterey Bay to uh, meet their very urgent need for uh, fresh water. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Brent here once again with us, uh, who's going to talk about adaptive utilization of carbon dioxide. Thank you. Uh, again, it's great to be in Santa Barbara. I love this place. Sometimes I wish I'd never left it. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, being, uh, taking all this CO2 into an a economically sustainable, prosperous activity um, that uh, people around the world will want to start doing, uh, even without government subsidies or taxation or penalties of any kind because it's, uh, it's a profitable activity, something that can take off virally and uh, uh, really address the CO2 problem in a big way. Also, about solutions to the CO2 problem that uh, are on the order of gigatons and make a significant difference um, in, in what we invest in them. You know, I, I, I founded a Calera and, you know, we really have uh, developed that first generation of technology getting us down the path. And I'll talk about all the first generation companies. Uh, but I think we're on the verge of branching out into the second generation, which can fully realize the, the original vision to get to gigaton scale solutions for uh, carbon dioxide. The, uh, I, uh, I have had a string of medical companies uh, before I started Calera, um, and one of the friends I started one of them with, Tom Fogarty, is a vascular surgeon at Stanford, and Tom's got, you know, over 100 patents and has started a whole bunch of medical device companies, and he always says, failure is only a prelude to success. And, uh, you know, if, if we're really going to address these big problems, we're, we're going to have some failures, and, uh, you got to learn from those mistakes and work past them. And that's how Tom's been such a successful uh, inventor of new medical products that have really uh, benefited a lot of people. When we look at uh, policy for carbon dioxide, um, you know, taking a couple of paths. One is what Tim Lentz calls a mitigation only path, which means we're going to go out and uh, we're just going to be less bad. 
and we're going to lower the amount of uh, carbon dioxide we're putting out. And the idea is that the natural sinks of carbon dioxide, like the ocean, for example, are going to pick up the excess. And by tw uh, the end of the century, you know, we'll be up around 500 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, and what he's proposed is, uh, you know, we have to work on mitigation of carbon dioxide, but um, we actually need to remove carbon dioxide as well to get to where we want to get to. Uh, and, you know, this path assumes that all the great things we're trying to make happen are going to happen, like we're going to go to a significant renewable portfolio, for instance. Um, and he says the accepted policy approach to achieving stabilization of atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration is to rapidly reduce carbon dioxide emissions to match natural sinks and then slowly reduce the carbon dioxide emissions to zero at the same rate that natural sinks decay, meaning the ocean no longer can take up carbon dioxide. And um, the reality is, if you look at um, the mix of... Uh, <coughs> anthropogenic CO2 sources, um, you know, and you, you look at uh, petroleum and coal and uh, what's, what's actually happening, you know, the, the mitigation pathway is, the, is certainly the right pathway, but it's not happening. It's especially not happening in, in Asia. And uh, if you take coal alone, um, and you look at China and India, the development of coal-fired power plants is, is overwhelming. And of course, CO2 is a global molecule. Even in the US, uh, our hopes are to have the most aggressive renewable portfolio we can. Um, but uh, it's just uh, without radical changes, uh, our electric are going to be powered by coal for quite a while. Um, there was an article published in Science three weeks ago that I think is particularly relevant because it talks about the state of California. You know, and it, as California goes, so does the world. And now that we have Assembly Bill 32, uh, we're under a, a, a specific protocol to reduce our uh, greenhouse gas emissions to 80 percent below 1990 levels by the year 2050. And that's a law. It was challenged. Mary Nichols signed it into law today. And, and we have to start working on it by 2020. We have to get uh, closer to 1990 levels. Um, and sort of taking advantage of the Sokolo idea of, of many wedges, uh, energy efficiency is, is one huge wedge that uh, is proposed. Electricity decarbonization, um, you know, improving the grid, solar, biofuels, cement, uh, and electrification. So we have to get from today of about 500 million tons of uh, CO2, of greenhouse gases, down to what we think is about 85, which is a huge, huge reduction. And in talking about how this is going to happen through these different areas, you can see between uh, 2030 and 2050 the, the amount of reductions that would be necessary. And, and they really fall into three areas. If we look at these wedges, there's energy efficiency. And in the mitigation scenario, we have to cut our consumption in half. Uh, in the in generation decarbonization area, we have to cut it uh, substantially to where we actually almost have no carbon being emitted under this scenario. And under electrification, uh, we have to dramatically increase the electrification in, in California. Uh, and of course, a lot of our electricity is actually imported, and this model assumes that the next door neighbor states are following the same uh, 
energy decarbonization that we are, which I can guarantee you, having worked in Wyoming, they're not working on it right now. But this is what this assumes. And the reason I think this is important is we're talking every country in the world. You know, if California were a country, it would be a significant country having to follow a, a scenario similar to this to really get where we think we're going. Um, and uh, so if we look at our baseline case, business as usual, uh, if we go uh, toward the highest energy efficiency we can do, you know, with, with non-transportation electricity, and then have uh, electric cars to electrify transportation, uh, we, we can hit about the same place. Uh, there's other uh, avenues taken, but regardless, compared to the baseline scenario, there's some high renewable scenarios, high nuclear. Uh, I, working with the Coastal Commission right now, I would bet that it's very unlikely that we're going to have any new nuclear plants in California in the next 30 years or 38 years. Uh, in fact, I'd, I'd be willing to bet anybody almost any amount of money that we're not going to have any no nuclear plants developed in California. High CCS, again, uh, very speculative mix. And here's what it would look like with no energy efficiency at all. And here's all the new generation, meaning gas-fired power plants, because they're the only thing that can respond when you have a lot of renewables, which are intermittent. You need a power plant you can turn on and turn off really quickly. Uh, the, a a tr tremendous amount of new transmission. And this all assumes that we learn how to store energy in batteries. And even the authors admit that this was the only scenario they were able to construct that w could come close to getting us there with all this, this new generation. Uh, well, what I'm going to tell you today is you could deal with the whole enchilada by converting the CO2 from fossil fuel sources and cement sources in California into cement and aggregate used in the roads in California and, and, and more than California. And not only that, you could do it in a prosperous way and not drive businesses and jobs out of California in doing it. Um, if you look at uh, some of the scenarios that, you know, by 2020, 2035, 2050 that are proposed, they're, they're, they're all costing billions of dollars. Uh, if we were to look at the alternative of replacing uh, all the money we're putting into roads and highways and we're paying foreign companies to do it. There are no US owned cement or gravel companies. Uh, not only could we do it, but we, it, it would actually make money and increase the tax revenue in the state doing it that way. So it's a very different way of looking at it. It's not a tax or a penalty or a law or a mitigation measure or an inducement. It's actually just a different way to do it. So the, the idea is if we look at uh, the 16 billion or so tons, the 16 gigatons of CO2 that humans are putting in the atmosphere every year uh, from mainly coal-fired power plants, but other industrial plants like cement plants, for example. Uh, that CO2 could be converted into CO3. This is a permanent step under most pH conditions. And uh, we could form about 30 billion tons of building materials a year, every year, sustainably, for as long as we want to do it. And there's a current market for these materials today. Uh, there, there's a robust there are technology that's being developed by many uh, parties now that allows us to take a lot of waste constituents like the CO2 and the criteria pollutants, fly ash. You know, there's going to be an enormous amount of produced water from all the fracking that's going to happen going forward in the United States. Uh, into uh, 
building materials that lack the carbon footprint of the, that they would normally have. So just looking at, at the size of these uh, gigaton reservoirs, there's, humans are putting approximately 28 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere every year. We're also mining about 32 billion tons of rock every year. And all that rock is mined in open pit mines. You know, coal, coal's a problem, but there's about 5 billion tons of coal mine, and it's all shaft mining. If you've ever been near a cement quarry and seen all the limestone that's been dug up, it, mining completely decimates the environment. It's so unsustainable. In California, we don't have any new rock quarries or mines, no new cement plants. Just like our electricity, we don't want it in our backyard. We import 60% of our aggregate from British Columbia and Northern California. It's all limestone. It's used in asphalt and road base and concrete. It's the preferred aggregate rock because it's stable at high pH. Here in Southern California, most of your aggregate comes from Mexico. And it, it's barged in with a huge carbon footprint. Uh, not to mention the environmental destruction it does from where it comes from, and it's completely un unsustainable. Um, 10 billion tons of aggregate are used in 12 and a half billion tons of concrete every year. And 5 billion tons of limestone are mined to make two and a half billion tons of Portland cement every year in addition to that. And, and aggregate and cement are the two constituents of concrete. Aggregate's also used in asphalt. It's 90% of asphalt. It's also used in road base. Um, and there's a, a quite a bit of uh, aggregate used road base every year. Now all these materials can be made by converting CO2 into, into carbonates. And this technology was well developed, and this is uh, everything I'll say about Calera Corporation is in the public domain. There's tons of information out there. They've got over uh, several hundred now patent applications which are published. So any level of detail you wanted to get about Calera, you can almost get uh, up to a year or two ago. Um, but the ability to turn carbon dioxide into a cement we're into aggregate, is well established, and it's well tested. Uh, just a little bit about Portland cement. The way you make Portland cement, and cement is the cementing constituent of concrete, and concrete is the most used building material. It's the most traded material other than water on the planet. Um, is for every ton of Portland cement you make, you release about a ton of CO2. So just Portland cement itself uh, has a, quite a uh, carbon footprint. Uh, if you look at the usage of Portland cement, especially in China, it's going up. And, and most of the cement is being built in China. And China is also building a lot of coal-fired power plants today. But if you look at the global market, it's about half a billion dollars in just materials between Asia, Europe, and the Americas. Of course, they make cement everywhere. Every small village in the world has a little cement kiln to make their mortar and everything else. Um, so just the materials themselves represent a, a huge market opportunity, maybe one of the largest market opportunities there is. Um, it's dominated by Lafarge, Holson, and CMAP, and, and many, many other companies. And a number of these companies are vertically integrated. They have ready-mix plants, cement quarries, aggregate quarries. Um, they're controlling what's probably one of the largest markets in the world. Um, they're not particularly interested in losing that market to a completely new technology. Um, to even go to a, a normal cement plant and upgrade it so that, say, you could do carbon capture and meet AB32 is why uh, you know, I was going to buy a cement plant up in Davenport, California from CMAX and convert it to a carbon sequestering <laughs> new cement plant. And they wouldn't even sell it to me because they saw us as competition. But they shut the plant down anyway. You know, there's a plant shut down in, in Southern California. People are losing their jobs. Cement's leaving the state. But if for another reason than to capture 
carbon dioxide and, and it generates some jobs in the United States. Remember, there are no U.S. cement companies of any size because there was an antitrust suit in 1978 for price fixing. And people were put in jail and fined. So all these cement companies are in Japan, France, Germany, shipping all over $100 billion in Department of Transportation money to overseas companies. You know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not benefiting the U.S. But it, it, aside from all that, if, if we did this just to stop mining, to make, a, to make a five tons of cement, uh, via the traditional process, you have to mine quite a bit of limestone, you put it in a kiln, you heat it, you burn some fossil fuel to make that cement. To get five tons of aggregate, you have to go to a quarry and scar the landscape permanently to come up with those five tons. These same materials can be made from a coal-fired power plant or any fossil fuel. For every ton of CO2, ton of coal you burn, you get about two and a half tons of CO2. And with two and a half tons of CO2, you can make about five tons of carbonate cement or five tons of artificial limestone that can be used as aggregate. So just to avoid mining, it's worth doing this. Um, it's well demonstrated, uh, and, and this is an old slide from the world of concrete uh, a few years ago, much further along now, that if you look at ordinary Portland cement, if you t take uh, how many kilograms of CO2 per cubic meter, of, when if you make a concrete with it, and this is just uh, the stuff this building's made out of, uh, there's about 365 kilograms of CO2 represented uh, in that meter cubed of concrete. If you use uh, uh, the, uh, a carbon uh, sequestering cement, you actually end up with a carbon negative product. And if you actually consider the offset of the cement you didn't use and you add that to the, the carbon negative aspect, it, it's significantly carbon negative. So if you look at a life cycle carbon uh, analysis and you look at power plant emissions, if you take uh, the full emissions of a power plant. And if you were to, say, uh, convert a lot of it and, and capture half the, uh, roughly half the CO2, and, and then of course you make CO2 in the process, your, your total displacement uh, can be quite substantial. Now there, there are two main reactions that are occurring, and this is the only chemistry I'm gonna bring up, but uh, and I was focused entirely on this reaction, calcium plus carbonate makes calcium carbonate. And uh, this is the way you, you make calcium carbonate in the lab. You, 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 you get a carbonate ion and a calcium ion. You know, it could be sodium carbonate or calcium chloride. And you make calcium carbonate. And that's how calcium carbonate is probably the most manufactured chemical there is. It's used in paper and the paint and these wallboards and milkshakes and everywhere, you know. Uh, and that's how it's done. And that's, that's what we did. Uh, it turns out most calcium carbonate on the planet, like 99.99% of it, actually is, is uh, produced uh, in biomineralization to make limestone via this reaction. Um, so, you know, I think part of what happened for me is that all the cement I'd ever scaled up before was used in orthopedic surgery, where a, a kilogram of cement would last a hospital a month. <laughs> you know, a ton of cement would, ask, would last even the largest trauma center in New York City a year, right? You might use 20 grams in a hip fracture, and that was a lot. Um, so I certainly didn't have a lot of experience thinking in terms of hundreds of tons. I've, I've built several manufacturing plants that have made this cement and cements like it, which are in operating rooms all over the world. But I, I'd never worked at the kind of scale we're talking about before. Um, and if you look 
at the Generation One companies, including Calera, Ecospec, Skyonic, New Sky, and there's many others, especially in China. There's many, many efforts doing this right now. They're all focused on that first reaction, calcium plus carbonate to make calcium carbonate. Um, and some of them are focusing on permanent sequestration, like into a cement product. Some of them are more like biofuels, where they're focusing on something that sequesters carbon dioxide, and then it would get released later. But they're all using basically the same chemistry, which is dependent on the concept that we're going to somehow come up with an, a lot of alkalinity, mainly hydroxide. There are other ways of doing it to create carbonate minerals. And this is where the rub comes in, is that uh, having to come up with a lot of this hydroxide to form carbonate in that first reaction is difficult to scale. Now, what we did at Calera, and this is well, well advertised and published in the public domain now, is we made a breakthrough in, in how to ma make alkalinity electrochemically, and we, we cut the uh, amount of energy and cost and carbon footprint in doing that substantially. Um, and uh, I think th this is actually going to revolutionize the specialty chemical industry aside from global warming. And, and scaled it up at, at one of the largest power plants uh, that burns fossil fuel on the West Coast, a, a 1,500 megawatt power plant uh, on Moss Landing, and, and went from a continuous uh, pilot plant to a, a 10 megawatt demonstration plant, built a, a large electrochemical plant doing all this, and showed that this, this general idea can be scaled. And then branched out and looked at the whole world about the different types of alkalinity, you know, some that are basically sodium hydroxide, and others that are more complicated and geologic in nature. Um, but this whole closed system approach uh, assumes that you, you really need these high pH solutions uh, with high concentrations of dissolved carbon uh, combined with electric to to take gaseous CO2, put it in a dissolved state, and form a, a, a bicarbonate ion, and eventually form calcium carbonate. And there's, you think about carbon mass balance and efficiency and CO2 absorption and capture. Um, and uh, I'm going to give an example that was the subject of a Department of Energy grant that was funded completely. It was $46 million, 23 from us and 23 from the DOE. Um, that, that it, that it's an example of first generation. This is the state of Wyoming. And this is a deposit of a of, of largely a mineral called trona, which is a sodium carbonate mineral and is available. And so you go out and look at the site and uh, to make calcium carbonate, you're looking at for massive amounts of calcium, source of alkalinity in the trona, and a source of CO2. And in this site, uh, this is Highway 80 going through the state. This is a very large coal-fired power plant that produces almost 15 million tons of CO2 a year. This is uh, another one over here, and uh, a large uh, carbonate deposit. Uh, in fact, this one is estimated to be the world's largest deposit of this mineral. It has a lot of just natural alkalinity, but a lot in the groundwater as well. Uh, it's been well mapped and established. Uh, and studying the hydrologic features, um, Hard water was extremely common. Extremely hard water was less common, but still very abundant. Shallow hard water was harder to get than deep, but still abundant. I mean, you didn't have to pump it far. Turns out in, in Wyoming, they produce 300 billion gallons of, produ of produced water every year just from the oil industry that they're having trouble getting rid of. And they're already pumping it up, and it's warm. You can actually get the heat out of it and use it in drying cement, for example. Uh, there's also alkaline water that's above 500 milliequivalents in extremely alkaline water, but it's less abundant. So you go out and you look at the state, and uh, the, uh, you can look at um, all the places 
where calcium has been sampled in the water and put together the data relative to the power plants. And, uh, you know, some of the water has uh, extremely high calcium concentrations, like, you know, seawater is like 410 parts per million calcium. You know, some of these are up in the range of uh, uh, much, much higher values, <laughs> as you can see, uh, you know, 70,000 ppm calcium. So plenty of calcium around. To, and, um, and uh, also other minerals that are of interest uh, in, in the process. And, and some, some of the, the water is available just through our teeth and springs coming up to the surface. You don't even have to drill it. And uh, there are pipelines going all over the place that you can transport the water from wellheads to power plants. So a very feasible, doable project. Um, it, uh, there's cement plants uh, in the area. There's a rail railroad network. Um, and uh, if you assume just a simple closed system approach, you would put this in an Aspen model, maybe, um, and look at the sensitivity. Like, for example, um, if you look at the interest rate on the money, uh, as the interest rate goes down, the internal rate of return also goes down. Not real surprising. If you look at the steepest line on the curve, the most sensitive thing, it's actually the price you can sell the cement at. You know, that a, a go, no go decision would be based on. And this first generation is stuck in the place of trying to make a profitable uh, carbon sequestration uh, solution right out of the gate, which, of course, no other new technology has ever been asked to do. Um, this uh, concern about the price of the product versus the uh, uh, lack of rate of return was the, I think, I believe the main reason we chose to turn down the DOE grant and give the money back. Uh, did a deal with uh, uh, a large power company in China and Inner Mongolia where there was, again, a source of alkalinity, a large alkaline lake. Uh, in the area and coal-fired power plants being built. With a closed system approach, you can make a box model and say how much flue gas you're taking in, how much sodium hydroxide you're purchasing, because in China they're making so much PVC, sodium hydroxide is a waste product and they're selling it for very little, even though it has a large carbon footprint. There's a lot of brine available. Um, so. You can certainly get to important solutions using the first generation technology. All these assume equilibrium reactions. Um, this whole idea that the planet was in equilibrium with regard to CO2 is actually brought up by Harold Urey in uh, his book, you know, thinking that CO2 was going to equilibrate with all the calcium silicate rocks via chemical weathering. And this equilibrium approach is still dominant in most climate modeling and the way we look at all of this. In fact, if you go to the IPCC, uh, all the, 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 the climate models that we base uh, international decisions on assume that all our carbon reservoirs are in equilibrium. Uh, so if you talk to the IPCC, they'll tell you that, uh, you know, there are about 38,000 uh, gigatons of CO2 in the deep ocean and 150 gigatons in seafloor sediment. Um, and this is, uh, this is what, how we're making all these decisions, you know, at Copenhagen and other places. Um, if you look a little deeper, you see that not only are there really a whole bunch of reservoirs, but in fact, if you just go to limestone alone, uh, there's on the order of, uh, much higher numbers than, than uh, we're looking at in organic material. But more, more important is all these different reservoirs have different residence times, and they're all out of equilibrium. And I guess what I've learned uh, is that 
if you're going to design a process to operate and address a global problem, you can't really be working at an industrial scale in a closed system. You have to be working in a gigaton scale and thinking about it as an open system. Now we call it really an ecosystem level of engineering. And I want to bring out an example of one of the first generation companies. This is a company in Singapore. And I, you know, I've seen some of their technology, but I, I can't validate it. But their approach to the problem is what I want to address. These guys are addressing a niche in the CO2 sequestration market, which is the shipping industry, which is a huge emitter of CO2. Uh, regulated, but fairly unregulated. Um, and they have a system that takes about 74% of the CO2 out of the ship's exhaust as it goes along. Um, it's pretty neat. You know, the, uh, the water comes in, and they use some of it to scrub the SO2 and other criteria pollutants out. And some of it goes through uh, their black box and uh, is used to scrub the CO2 out. It forms a carbonate sludge, just like the other first generation companies. Uh, some of it is stored, and some of it is just goes out into the open ocean, falls to the bottom. It's not a closed system. They're just taking in the seawater, treating it, taking the calcium out with the CO2, and they're, they're moving along, doing this the whole time. Um, it's, uh, we, they're not very open about what they're doing, but they have a large deal with one of the largest shipping lines in the world, and they're doing this today. And they're making a lot of calcium carbonate, and they're removing their emissions. Uh, and they're not trying to change the pH of the ocean or anything. They're just doing something on a small scale. I developed a process for uh, the most used hip and knee prosthesis in the world once uh, that is out there. If any of you have a hip replacement, it's an uncemented hip replacement, there's a 50% chance it's, it's one of mine. And what we did is we just did something very similar to this, obviously on a smaller scale, where we were on a very small scale introducing uh, calcium and carbonate and phosphate ions, forming uh, little crystals in a one unidirectional flow, coating the implants, and it helped the bone grow on. I know this is doable, um, but they've actually commercialized it, and they're out exploiting this niche, doing it every day. But they're letting, the, letting it all sink to the bottom of the ocean, and maybe it's dissolving, and maybe it's redissolving as CO2. But the, the point is, when we think about industrial processes, you know, we usually start at the bench top, and then we make that beaker a little bigger, and we make the beaker bigger, and we, we make the beaker bigger, and we say we're compensating for factors of scale, but our imagination really isn't changing. We get to a commercial scale, scale and we got a big old beaker. Uh, and that works for a lot of processes, but it, it just won't work for something global like CO2. You, we've, processes have to be thought about at the size we're really talking about. And I could have used mass, but here I'm just talking about dimensions. But most industrial scale processes include, assume we're working in a closed system. And at the, the scale we're talking about, when you're pumping you know, billions of gallons of water, you're making millions of tons of material you're sequestering millions of tons of CO2 and other pollutants, you're never going to be in a closed system. You're never going to control everything. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, pictures. This uh, is in the Admiralties during World War II. There was a corps in the military called the Seabees, and when they needed an airway, they would call in the Seabees. And the Seabees would go out at low tide around the coral reef and the back reef and scoop up all the sediment, which is very similar to material to what you get when you precipitate calcium and magnesium carbonates from CO2 from water. It's an unstable carbonate. They would put it all up on, on the low island and bulldoze it and steamroll and irrigate it with fresh water in which it's unstable. And it would harden up to a limestone runway. And th those, those runways are still there. I use them during my graduate work in French Polynesia. Uh, you know, of course, the pyramids are built out of limestone. They've been there for a while. Uh, but my favorite story in all of this is George Schultz, who's up at Stanford now, and he's the head of the Institute, the Hoover Institute for Energy Efficiency. Every time I show this slide, he tells the same story, and I absolutely love it. And you have to remember, Secretary Schultz, 
who is the, uh, the CEO of Bechtel. Now, Bechtel pours more concrete than just about anybody in the world. They're the, the specifier. And in fact, so one of his stories is how proud he is that Bechtel could pour the concrete in a nuclear power plant in one continuous pour. But the other story he tells, it, right next to it, is that he said, hey, I was there. I saw that. Because he was a Marine in World War II. And there was twice when they captured and secured islands in the South Pacific and called in the Seabees to build these runways. So you got this one guy that, first of all, has probably poured as much concrete as anybody in the whole world has ever poured, who's also witnessed as a young man, as a Marine, these runways being built, and then two weeks later seeing heavy equipment landing on them. And the, the whole concept you know, could coalesce for him because he's seen it. Um, so the point I wanted to make is that there's a real opportunity out there to sequester many, many gigatons of CO2 in concrete and asphalt and road base in a way that currently represents a $500 billion market. The money's there to do it. We're going to be improving roads. There's an, a need for it. There's a use for it. Now I want to talk about some insights that I have about where I think the next generation is going to go to get to those gigaton levels where we're not limited. And, and, and it's basically that most organisms don't use that first reaction I showed you of calcium plus carbonate makes calcium carbonate. They use that other reaction I was showing you. Now, if we look at the history of the planet, uh, what we know from the Phanerozoic, from a many different lines of evidence, is even though today's carbon dioxide level is about three or 400, about 100 million years ago, we think it was around 2,000. And uh, if we take modern organisms and we put them in high CO2 levels, all the current literature says they can't survive, they can't calcify. Um, so if we look at what happens to the partial pressure of CO2 from pre-industrial levels to the present day, and we double it or triple it or quadruple it, uh, CO2 goes, goes up to about where it was 100 million years ago. And uh, what happens is that uh, that carbonate ion that the first reaction is dependent on almost goes away because the pH of the ocean is dropping. And uh, you have some more dissolved CO2, but the bicarbonate that the second reaction depends on becomes more abundant. And if we look at it, uh, the carbonate ion goes, you know, we lose a negative amount of it, but the bicarbonate ion increases. So there's more and more of this as we increase CO2. Now, just to put all that in perspective, 2,000 ppm is a fraction of the flue gas coming out of a gas-fired power plant. Okay? A gas-fired power plant is about 3 to 4 percent CO2 in the flue gas. Okay? That's 30 to 40,000 ppm. So, but this is what most organisms are doing. And in fact, over the last 650 million years, um, there have been a lot of changes in the uh, mineralogy of the carbonates that have formed, which are based on even more interesting changes in seawater chemistry. Um, but the point is that as the, the chemistry of the seawater has changed, the organisms have changed too. But if we look at just abiotic calcification, if you fly over the Great Bahamas Bank, there are these shoals that are tens to even hundreds of kilometers long of these little inorganic calcium carbonate spheres that form called ooids. And they're very prolific in the geologic record. And they're forming inorganically all day, every day, especially on hot afternoons when the hot the heat of the water drives the CO2 off and changes the carbonate equilibrium. And 
Um, we know, for example, that if we go back to the Cretaceous 100 million years ago when a lot of uh, calcium carbonate was forming, even the corals that normally form one type of calcium carbonate were so affected by the ocean chemistry, by the higher CO2 at that time, that they actually made the same skeletons, and this has been investigated in great detail, but out of a different mineral, a different carbonate mineral. That's how influenced they were by the water chemistry. And if we go to these massive carbonate formations, and remember, most of the carbon on the planet is in limestone. Like for 90% of the carbon on the planet is in limestone. It's not in the atmosphere, the biosphere, the hydrosphere. It's all essentially all in the lithosphere. And it's in places like the Austin Chalk, the White Cliffs of Dover, the Great Barrier Reef. That's where all the carbon is in, in carbonates. And in the Cretaceous, when the CO2 was the highest, is when we formed the most carbonates. And that doesn't make sense because we know as CO2 gets higher, calcium carbonate becomes more soluble. But in fact, almost all the carbonate that's formed is biogenic. So organisms are doing something different. They didn't read the chemistry book. Um, and in fact, there's a, about 70 to 100 million gigatons of CO2 in limestone. So the whole atmosphere has about 400 million gigatons. There's 70 to 100 million, 400 gigatons. There's 70 to 100 million gigatons of uh, CO2 sitting in rocks. Now, and, and a lot of those rocks formed during the Cretaceous when CO2 was really high. Now, in a way, it makes sense. The, the more CO2 you have, the more bicarbonate you form, and then there's more raw material to make more, more carbonate. If you go out in the ocean today, if you fly over the Atlantic, uh, especially during the summer, you'll see these massive algal blooms of uh, coccoliths that are forming calcium carbonate. They have about a one-day life cycle. And this guy, Emiliana huxleyi, is one of the most abundant coccoliths uh, there is on the planet. It's responsible for a lot of oxygen production. It's responsible for a lot of the CO2 that makes it into the mineral phase. It uses exclusively bicarbonate ion to make this mineral. Um, well, uh, this was in science last spring. Uh, it's, it's interesting. It says, ocean acidification response to rising atmospheric CO2 partial pressures is widely expected to reduce calcification in marine organisms. From the mid-Mesozoic coccolithophores have been major calcium carbonate producers in the world oceans, today accounting for about a third of the total marine calcium carbonate production. Here we present laboratory evidence that calcification in that primary production in the coccolithophore species Emiliani huxleyi are significantly increased by high CO2 partial pressures. Field evidence from the deep sea is consistent with these laboratory results indicating that over the past 220 years, a 40% increase in the average coccolith mass has occurred. Our Findings show coccoliths are already responding and probably continue to rising CO2 partial pressures, which has important implications for biogeochemical modeling of future oceans and climate. So with, with this species, when the CO2 was increased from 280 in pre-industrial to 304 to near 500 to 750, it actually calcified more when there's more bicarbonate in the water. So it's sequestering more CO2, not less. And if you go back to the pre-industrial area, we can track from deep sea sediments uh, what they were doing. And the average mass actually increased as, as uh, CO2 has increased. So organisms are doing something with the bicarbonate ion that works pretty well for them. This has been shown with a number of species. This is a green algae, which is the main sediment producer on structures like the Great Barrier Reef, which represents billions of tons of sequestered carbon dioxide. Now, this is a really interesting one. This is a tridacnid clam. It's like the man-eating clam you saw in cartoons. Um, these are very massive clams. 
And there's an ancient analog, another mollusk that, uh, these are called rudistid mollusks. And each one of these is, uh, you know, half a meter in diameter. They form massive reefs. A lot of the oil in the Middle East, in Mexico, Indonesia, other places, is in these porous rocks. They're the reservoirs. They're, they're some of the most prolific mineralizers in the history of the planet. And they, we believe they had a lifestyle very similar to the modern tridactinid clam. And one part of it is they had plants living in their tissue. Uh, they uh, formed these massive reefs all over. And uh, through geologic time, but particularly uh, in the Cretaceous, when the CO2 levels were quite high. And if we look at uh, mechanisms on what they're doing, I believe this will be where the insight is to optimize this second reaction I was telling you about and take the uh, scaling of carbon sequestration to a level, to any level just like it is in the ocean without the need for ridiculous amounts of alkalinity and use that, for that second reaction that uses bicarbonate because you can interact CO2 with water and get to bicarbonate very easily because of the high disassociation constant of carbonic acid. And let me show you an example of one system that we could mimic from nature that would allow us to do this even easier. This is a modern coral. And what modern corals do is um, they occupy what's called an exoskeleton of calcium carbonate, and the, the tissue on the top is, uh, contains plants. So it's an animal, but it functions as a plant. And uh, in that tissue layer, right above the skeleton, there are uh, plants living in the stomach, and it's right up against the skeleton, and small vesicles inside that tissue layer that produce very small seed crystals that are exocytose outside of some subcellular bodies from the Golgi apparatus. And they form the nucleus of the skeleton. And they have very interesting mineralogy, but they nucleate enormous amounts of calcium carbonate using bicarbonate ion. And these are the most prolific calcifiers on Earth today. Uh, these nuclei packets that get exocytose have special nucleating capability and crystals start to nucleate on them in seconds. And those crystals have very interesting crystal structures um, that are what we call growth modulated um, that make them highly unstable and give them interesting nucleating properties. Uh, and they make different minerals with different crystallographic properties actually line up together. But you can take a coral skeleton with no tissue around it where these seed nuclei form and uh, just put them in regular seawater. So this is just a raw coral skeleton with these seed nuclei. And uh, after a minute in uh, just regular seawater, they start nucleating uh, extensive amounts of uh, calcium carbonate. And uh, this is actually what I base my first bone cements on that are commercialized all over the world is this basic technology, if you can call it a technology, a biomimetic example, I guess. Not only do, do they make it really easy to precipitate, but they, uh, they do it in a very specific way. Some crystals will always make other crystals that look like this. Others will make ones that look like that. Others like this, predictably, reproducibly each time, or like that. So the point of showing you that is, uh, I believe the next generation of carbon sequestration, carbon conversion technology is right on the cusp of being developed and being available. And I also believe from a policy point of view that the idea that we're going to take all the carbon dioxide and convert it into building materials is the right one. And I believe in the state of California, for example, we could address 
almost the whole, if not more than the whole, desire to be 80% below 1990 levels by 2020 just by sequestering our emissions and converting it to asphalt and road base and concrete. And we could do so sustainably in a prosperous economic way. But I think it's going to take a lot of policy and it's going to involve both public and private partnerships. These have been very successful in Southern California. They're financed with tax exempt municipal bonds. There's no reason the Department of Transportation shouldn't get in and fund some of these efforts. Um, they've done it by forming joint powers authority between the municipalities, and there's no reason that this, these couldn't even be publicly owned. You know, a lot of water is publicly owned. Well, next to water, concrete is one of the most sold and distributed materials. Why can't the public own concrete? I mean, it's all public money that's funding the roads anyway. Why do we give all the money to foreign companies? Um, it'll take a lot of regulatory coordination and cooperation to get this done. And by being publicly owned, we'll be much further along, along the, the road to get that done. So I think using California as an example, I, I believe that it's possible to meet those objectives that we have but we need to do more than what we're thinking about doing now. And I think this one solution could get us a long way there in an economic way. And so that's what I had to say. Groundwater is just. So you don't have to add in, so you don't have to go and find any, any basic right. material if you put the plant. That's right. Yeah, yeah and just to restate it, uh, so in the first generation, we're, it was all about finding alkalinity. And, and that will work, I believe, up to hundreds of millions of tons in certain locations. You know, the profitability needs to be evaluated case by case. You know, it's the price of the product. A lot of things. But I believe the second generation is going to work on that second reaction where you don't need all that alkalinity. And that changes the whole ball game. And uh, I believe that's what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, well, that, that's the, the most interesting thing about, you know, what we learned in the first generation, and this is highly published and it's in patents and everything, that, um, you know, you, you, when you interact raw flue gas with any water, SO2 goes to SO4, so that's easy. You know, the different nitrogen compounds are problematic, but some of them do, some of them don't, and there's ways of doing that. But when you're precipitating carbonates, you're getting mercury, arsenic, lead, all that good stuff into insoluble phases. Uh, plus, you're getting the CO2. And uh, it, uh, you know, like a coal-fired power plant has CO2 emissions that are like 150,000 parts per million CO2. A refinery is almost a million parts per million <laughs> CO2. A uh, gas-fired power plant is three or four or 30 or 40,000 parts per million CO2. The atmosphere, you know, is 400 parts per million CO2. You know, and the, the, what, what, if you're thinking about a closed system, then you're worried about how much water you're pumping, what the absorption rate is, and all that. If you're working in an open system like that ship I showed you, you're not worried about that. You know, 
and you, you're not uh, you're not working on a, a, as closed a system. So it's going to take different thinking. You know, not just understanding that that second reaction is probably where we should be working, not the first reaction, but also thinking about how to implement it. But I think it's it's very doable. Yeah, the ship. So they actually have to have that. Yeah, they, they, they have electrodes and yeah, an and ultra uh, high frequency way of uh, modulating the alkalinity of the seawater um, in that case. But they could be a lot more efficient. And I think they're actually using the second reaction quite a bit and they don't realize it. Yeah. Yeah. I have a few words. Uh, things about the biogenic calcification. Yeah. Um, I think the, uh, the actual calcification in, uh, in, in corals and in uh, eucalyptus forests is done in an environment with a bi very high pH, the uh, calcifying fluid, and the carbonate is precipitated rather than the bicarbonate, I think. Um, and uh, second, uh, Can I comment on that comment? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Can I comment on that yeah, comment? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, my... I mean, things might have changed. My PhD thesis was on, uh, entitled, uh, well, my, my NSF grant for my pre-doctoral fellowship was the sclerogenetic process of corals. And I think I've spent more time monitoring the pH of the sclerogenetic milieu of corals than anybody else. And uh, we've done a lot of work on that. Uh, my postdocs were in isotopes. We've done NMR. And we're certain, in fact, it is a bicarbonate ion that's involved. And, and there's also a, a wealth of literature about coccolis, about the bicarbonate ion, is what's being used. There, there may be a little bit of carbonate, but there's not much of it around. The, the carbonic anhydrase that you see is, uh, you know, helps, it works as really a, a, a catalyst to uh, put CO2 from the gas phase into the diffuse phase but it's not producing more carbonate ion. There, there's not a mechanism to increase the amount of carbonate ion. Well, I think the, uh, the, the idea is, I mean, uh, I'm sure you're, you're aware of the work of uh, Anna Cohan from Boots Hall, um, getting uh, measurements of aragonized saturation states in the, calci in, in the calcifying fluid of right. exceeding 20 times. And uh, okay. I think the idea is, is that there is a calcium uh, hydrogen uh, pump that uh, creates a high pH and carbohydrates that is uh, converting bicarbonate uh, into carbonate and the precipitation itself is the, uh, is, is the carbonate. Um, I mean, that's what, 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 uh, what I see mostly in the literature of the last two, three years. Um, there is this discrepancy about, well, how can it be that if you fertilize uh, coccolithophores, some strains of uh, Emiliano with uh, bicarbonates, why do they calcify more? And I think that's because of stimulation of photosynthesis and generating more energy for the calcification process, rather than a direct effect on, on calcification. And uh, I think that's a pretty uh, common idea in the last two years also. Yeah. I don't know how increasing the calcium concentration would create more carbonate ion, and I, I don't know how uh, increasing the bicarbonate concentration would stimulate more photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Um, and yeah. some strains of um, uh, coccolithophores, um, they don't have a good carbonate uh, and a good concentrating mechanism, and so they are basically limited bicarbonate of photosynthesis. If you increase uh, the bicarbonate concentration, they, uh, the limitation is partially uh, removed. They uh, photosynthesize better. Well, I think, th I think there, there are several factors in the system, but because this happens in our inorganic systems as well, it's not just the coupling with photosynthesis, but it's true. If you do have photosynthesis occurring, it's going to take up CO2. But uh, we can do all this inorganically as well. So it, it's, not, it's not just the manipulation we see with, uh, you know, the biologic, the physiologic processes alone. We know that. <laughs>
because we can, we can f follow these same reactions in an inorganic system. The uh, precursors, uh, these, these, uh, uh, the, the proteins that use as primers for? Well, yes, you can use nucleating proteins like beta sheet proteins, and they'll do it. But in this case, I showed inorganic crystal. down for precipitation, you will see that uh, without any biological interaction. Right, but you're, you're at the pH you're at, there's very little carbonate ion. And so you're accounting for more than just the carbonate ion. That's the, uh, what do you mean? If you have a pH of 8.2? Yeah, you need to get up above about 9.3 before you have significant amounts of carbonate exist as a carbonate ion. Yeah, but if, if you look at the actual uh, mass balance of what you're precipitating, um, you would require much more uh, carbonate to get that amount of precipitation if you weren't using bicarbonate. I mean, if you take out the carbonate, then the bicarbonate will, will, um, will shift to, the, to carbonate. Right, but, but it's not in equilibrium. That's the whole point. See, all these calculations are done in equilibrium, but that never exists. No, they're not. They're far out of equilibrium. Um, you know, the, in terms of this technology, uh, we did receive support from the Department of Energy, um, but where we really need support is from um, really the Department of S Transportation because they dole out all the money to the states, and uh, Caltrans controls that, and almost all that money is spent on large projects that uh, are often run by these large companies that are outside the United States. Um, and if the Department of Transportation had the ability to prefer that we use technology from within the United States owned by American companies, there would be a vast sea change in all the concrete we use, uh, especially if it could be this kind. And it's, it's, so we're spending over $100 billion a year giving it to foreign companies to build our roads. And th that one change would have a, 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 a huge effect aside from what we're trying to achieve in AB 32. Um, the goals of AB 32 are really challenging. Shouldn't we be putting our efforts more into the um, reductive cycle of carbon dioxide? 
electronics that we can then reutilize in a closed system, then instead of immobilizing them into minerals that we can no longer utilize in any form? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if you make biofuels and you burn biofuels, it puts CO2 back into the atmosphere, you know. Yeah, you know, sure. yeah. Whereas, like, I mean, I'm just kind of trying to point out here that I mean, if this process were to be taken to its full extent, we would be slowly depreciating the amount of bioavailable carbon on the planet Earth, right? Well, you know, I mean, I mean, granted, we have a lot of it, yeah. but I mean, you know, do you, do you see the end result there? Yeah, no, I, 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 that would be awesome if we had to worry about going into another ice age, you know. I mean, I would love to have that problem. That would be such a great problem to have. You know, to have to make that decision. But it's, it's yeah. not just the you know, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and our you know, rising sea levels, but like literally our energy accessibility. Like, uh, like we right now depend upon photosynthesis essentially and the carbon dioxide cycle going from an oxidized form of carbon to a reduced form of carbon and back again for all life. So. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason Mars and Venus have a, a carbon dioxide atmosphere and we have CO2 is because of life, right? We, yeah. And uh, I mean, th those are great thoughts, you know, and if we could, you know, have to worry about that, that would be great. But right now, with coal-fired power plants, we don't have many other choices. But I, I think, I mean, that, theoretically and qualitatively, I think that makes a lot of sense. 